hope all's well wherever you are. Probably a lot of you on the East Coast are in snow right now. And uh, I'm here in Southern California in San Diego area at the Elfin Forest Preserve. So it's definitely my home. And I'm hanging out right now with one of my favorite plants out here, which is called Black Sage, Salvia mellifera. And um, all mint family plants have a very similar signature, such as they have a square stem. They have uh, bilaterally symmetrical flowers and opposite leaves. And so opposite leaves, you can see here, they're pairs, right, like arms. And if I spin it, you can see another pair of arms versus alternate, which the leaves will alternate like a staircase. And so the mint family or the Lamiaceae can be identified by a square stem, opposite leaves, as well as the flowers when it's in flower will be what's called bilaterally symmetrical, which means like a face. If you draw a line down the center, you have two eyes, you have two nostrils. And so every flower in the mint family has those three properties. And if you can see that, um, then you know it's in the Lamiaceae, the mint family. And in this case, the mint family is actually entirely medicinal and edible. Um, most of them are low dose for medicinal reasons. They're not foods, but they all have very similar digestive, blood purifying, um, neuron enhancing, um, organ cleansing effects, as well as lots of antioxidants. So whenever you're working with the mint family, it's going to help you. Um, part of that is Hello friends. Part of that is um, due to the aromatic nature. So if we analyze sage, this one, salvia, we notice it has a smell. And that smell is indicative of its medicinal properties. And one of the ways you can start seeing uh, ecology is in the way that chemistry is language. And so if we can smell scent on a plant, that's actually chemistry. And so what are those chemicals? Those are the essential oils and the hydrosols and maybe the terpenes and the resins of this plant, which actually have a scent. And so those affect your body in a certain particular way. And so the mint family, those aromatic properties, like we know essential oil, goes into your bloodstream and purifies microbes, right? Is antibacterial, antiviral. Um, so any mint family plant is going to have those properties because they all smell. They all smell varyingly. Whorehound, for example, another plant that grows around here, uh, doesn't have as aromatic of a smell. Uh, so this one's gonna be stronger for certain antimicrobial effects. So this one's really helpful for the respiratory system, cleaning the blood. Um, really opening up the lungs, um, probably induces sweating and is a diuretic, which means help with flushing out toxins through the urine. Um, part of that is because of its aromatic nature, that is the chemistry that actually affects the body. And so then um, this one is, of course, as well as most of these plants, um, aren't to be harvested in a unsustainable way. And there's a lot that can be said about what is sustainable harvest and where is it okay. And I believe in the proliferation of the plants that you want to work with. So I always recommend, you know, taking some of the seeds, right, and actually sprinkling them around and helping them spread um, when they're a native plant versus an invasive plant, which um, there are ways to work with that in a different way. Um, regenerative agriculture to the forest uh, is pretty much what all of our ancestors have been doing for millions of years and we kind of dropped the ball on that and as a result we live in grocery store mentality but these are some of our uh, local pharmacopoeia and so black sage salvia mellifera is just a really wonderful aromatic highly resinous plant and um, of course this is a sage right a true sage which is in the salvia genus let's see what else we want to look at so there's a lot of California buckwheat around here. So this is the Chumash and other native people of this region in Southern California worked with this as a grain source. So this is like the commercial buckwheat that we grow or kasha. Um, it's also in the Polygonaceae, which is things like um, Japanese knotweed and bamboo and smart weeds. And they all have a very similar diamond shaped seed. And so these are nitrogen fix fixers for the soil, but they're also an edible carbohydrate fat source and they have proteins. So 
if you were able to collect these and winnow the chaff off of these, then you have an edible grain source. And it's actually a pretty profound thing to try to do. And you really get the understanding of the industrial system behind getting us as much grain as we consume. So grain is a highly processed food and this kind of local or wild harvesting and processing really helps to ground you into where your food source comes from. And of course these are a survival food out here and they're edible and beautiful and they turn this beautiful rust color. Uh, the rest of the plant does as well at certain times of season, but it's rained here so it's pretty moist. Who else is around? So then there's a pine here. Of course, the country has a lot of pine trees and um, a pine can be distinguished from what's called an evergreen by the fact that pines have usually longer needles than most of the ever other evergreens. And they also have a place where the leaves or the needles are joined. Can I have one of those? Thanks. So you can see possibly that there's these little bracts and there's many needles coming out of them. This is a smaller one, so it's going to be harder to see. But there you have a pair of two leaves and they meet at a bract at the base. And so these will get bigger, but these all contain vitamin C. Um, they're helpful for drinking, uh, for cold and flu, things like that. They also cleanse the liver and the kidneys and they're all over the country and so you know scurvy was the lack of vitamin c in people's diet and pines are very universal some of the other evergreens can also be worked with as a tea that have vitamin c uh, they taste the taste varies and some are better than others but when i'm walking i like to even chew on a few nibbles of these and get that phytochemistry into my bloodstream um, you know, I also like to consider how everything that this plant has accumulated in its body is coming from the ecosystem that it lives in. And so therefore, it's kind of a readout, a chemical readout of the entire ecosystem and much of what's happened here since that tree was alive. Um, let's see. Eddie, what's up? He says, ever coming up to Shasta County, Northern California? You know, come out to California three times. And every time I'm like, I got to get to Northern California. But it just doesn't really happen. Uh, so I'm not sure that it's going to happen this time either. But I'm in Southern Cali until uh, February. And then I think I'm going to start heading east. I'm going to spend some time again at Cherry Valley Cooperative Farm this year. Uh, hopefully do some mentorships in the physical. I'm feeling lately like... Uh, I'm just really nurturing time with people off screen and that's been kind of a new thing and really helpful and I've just been going within and refining everything about everything and uh, you know spending a lot of time with plants and that's so important. Um, so with the pine, you also get pine pollen, which in Southern Cali is about to start dropping in some places. Uh, on the East Coast, it drops around May, and there you get all kinds of nutrients, including what are called phytoandrogen, and that's basically a plant testosterone precursor, and so it helps with building testosterone. Um, so it's actually incredibly helpful for men's health. Um, and then there's an inner bark on all the pine trees, right? The cambium layer, which is the living tissue of the tree, is able to be rendered into either a flower or I like to fry it like bacon. Um, and then it gets a little crunchy. And so um, that is an edible carbohydrate source, a survival food. But there's a way to harvest it that's regenerative and the, there's a way to harvest the tree that you would kill it. So downed branches after storms is a really good way to harvest. Or if you were to cut into the tree bark, if you were in a survival situation or anything like that, you cut upright, right? Cut a strip. Don't cut around the tree. <laughs> that's called girdling. And that's really uh, going to kill the tree. So if you cut a strip a long ways, you can definitely have access to the uh, inner bark, as well as you can actually take the outer bark and put it back, right? You can seal that up and you can use pine sap um, or hide glue or anything. That's what native people did. So they'd actually seal it back so that the tree could still have its skin, its protective skin, so that it doesn't get an infection. Trees get infections too. 
Um, Mish de Supa says, can you make tea with pine or just eat it for more effect? I like to nibble it, as I mentioned, but you can also make a tea from it. And just anything that you want to make a tea from that has aromatic compounds like we talked about before, you don't want to boil it because you can get very bitter uh, terpenes and resins out of it if you boil it. So you want to simmer it on medium heat for a longer period of time and then keep a lid on it because those aromatic oils cycle, right? So they would evaporate if there was no lid on it. So if you want all the medicinal compounds of a plant um, that's aromatic, right, keep a lid on it, but make sure it doesn't boil. Christine, what's up? You need to find mugwort? I've been seeing it all over I have a bunch, so why don't you send me a private message? I'll harvest for you, and I'll send you some. If you can't find it, it's all over the place. Lion Hawk, thank you. Appreciating your appreciation, and I appreciate appreciation. What's up, Adam? How's it going? Um, yeah, mugwort. So Artemisia douglasiana is the species in Southern California. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. The leaves are a lot bigger than vulgaris, but it's a native plant here. And people really want it, but we have a lot on the East Coast. So what I'm kind of talking about more and more is why don't we get people to harvest it on the East Coast, dry it out, and send it over to our West Coast friends. Um, we have so much of it, and it's an invasive plant, and it's just abundant and ready for harvest. Uh, so Artemisia vulgaris is the non-native species right and it's like basically lawns on the east coast so if anybody's interested in artemisia vulgaris of course i have tincture available and i also have um plenty of access to it when i'm back east in the spring so what i did was i left cherry valley farm in the fall i drove across the country teaching i did a tour had really good connections i feel like i'm building uh, connections hubs all across the country who are really interested in sustainability survival skills creating emergency hubs having places to host potlucks uh, you know classes workshops retreats all of them have different skill sets and access due to the habitat, due to the land, due to the resources that they have. But they're really all interested in raising community and bringing people together uh, to reskill, you know. So um, now I'm uh, uh, in the Southern California coast and probably about February I'll start heading back east. So I'll hit a bunch of states and hopefully I'll be in your town and we can hang and talk plants and gather the people who care. That's what <laughs> 2020 is about. Vote for the people who care. Um, let's see, there's a lot of elderberry here. This isn't one, but it looks similar. Um, right now it's kind of dark. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of leaves on it. So then these are wild mustards, and yesterday I taught a fermentation class, and uh, I was mentioning about how I've made wild mustard, um, you know, in jars. Uh, collect mustard seed, put them in a jar, and then you can pour salt water over it a little bit of turmeric and shake the jar once a day and leave it there for five to 12 days. Um, make sure you shake it every single day. So I'll just squeeze the lid on, shake it, and then open it so that it can breathe. And that gets you fermented, lacto-fermented mustard. And so these seeds are mustard seeds, these spindly things. And there's a lot of wild, quote unquote, invasive mustards all over Southern Cali. And there could totally be like a wonderful, fun cottage industry of people making local lacto-fermented wild mustard seed, um, you know, mustard. And that can really help to um, localize the community and the in incentive as well as be uh, partnering with ecology, local ecology, to get our needs met like our local foods or our local commerce or our local jobs or whatever that is. Um, what's up, Adam Ray Peterson? And so here's just one of these. This is probably black mustard, and black mustard is a little fuzzy on the leaves. Whoops. So here's a couple of them. These are really young greens, so they'd be fine to eat right now. I'd cook them up. Once they get a little older, they're pretty fuzzy, but there's another brassica species. So this is the brassica family, right? Brassicaceae, the mustard family, or used to be called the cruciferaceae, which means cross flowers, right? So four petals. Um, six stamen, one, let's see, stamen, petal, sepals, pistils. So you have four petals, six stamen, four tall, two short, if you break it open and look, 
and then you have one pistol. And so if you had like a magnifying glass, you could identify the brassica family with that. That comes from Tom Elpel's book, Botany in a Day. Really insightful stuff. But these brassicas, and then there's another species called Sacimbrium. Uh, that's actually the genus of a plant, and that one's much tastier. But these aren't super bad, and they're of course able to be eaten, and that's what produces the seeds. So Southern Cali is cool because you have the young basil rosette, but you also have the older ones. And um, there's a lot of different fluctuation in the habitat, so that enables you to have a lot of different um, things are flowering and dead at the same time. And so here's another so-called invasive invaders, you know. Got to build a wall to keep these uh, plants out, you know. And so um, this one is actually Brazilian, pe no, sorry, Peruvian pepper. And there's two species of these, and there's Brazilian pepper and Peruvian pepper. And they, this one specifically has an amazing aromatic oil in the leaves. And so what we found about this one, and what I've learned about Peruvian pepper, is um, the traditional people in Peru would actually use this for limpia, or cleansing the sort of energetic field, but also not just energetic field, the physical microbial field. It has antimicrobial compounds, so when you're wiping that across your body, um, it's also like an essential oil bath. And so they would just bundle this up and cleanse off. So you know when you get that negative energy going to the grocery store or whatever, just take a bunch of this and rub it off and throw it off to the woods and say, no, thank you. But um, if you're not into that, it is also a medicinal uh, herb. Oh, there's a mushroom. It's also a medicinal herb and um, is really carminative. So that's heating, helpful for digestion, but should be worked with in low dose because it has concerns about those aromatic oils. Although if there was research done, it would probably be found out that there's a safe and healthy dose. But since they're not doing that kind of research, it's a little confused. Um, yeah, Eddie, there's also wild radish in Southern Cali. It's all over the place. It's another so-called invasive, so you can get all the radishes you like from the parks, you know, and wild mustards. Remove invasive plants, save the planet, get free food. Seems like a win-win. Um, and so this one also has peppercorns, and they're pink peppercorns. And I've talked to people like Christopher Nurgis and other people in... Uh, the town over the years being here and he said that he actually tried to get them sold he actually tried to sell them and then there's this concern over allergies for these Brazil uh, Peruvian peppercorns they're essentially pink peppercorn and the question is are they the same thing they're just selling us at Whole Foods from Indonesia and stuff like that can we work with this local source in a way that's safe and effective and again it's the same kind of concern um, you know, about, oh my God, maybe these aromatic oils are bad for you. And it might just be that we don't have the dose capitulated for a safe and healthy dose. And some people can get allergic to anything. So how do we determine our allergic reaction chances from this plant? Uh, that's all research that needs to be done. And then, um, you know, the leaves can also be made into a carminative tea. You can bathe with it for spiritual bathing, cleansing yourself. Or even, um, you know, if you had a cold or a microbial infection, it could be helpful there. Um, so it's a really beautiful and aromatic herb. And uh, I'll just show you this little mushroom. It's been raining. So this is just a, a little brown mushroom, right? A brown-capped, uh, brown-gilled mushroom with a stem that has a lot of striations on it. It's kind of uh, fibrous is what I mean by that. And so there's really no need for going f much further with this unless it stains blue right now. Um, and it's known as a little brown mushroom. And often people don't even go for identifying these. And it could be something like a gallerina, which are entirely, incredibly poisonous. Uh, but they're really fun. And it's great to see mushrooms because that means there's a microbial network under here, which is in a symbiotic relationship with all the plant roots, um, a mycorrhizal relationship. I see another mushroom. This is probably the same one, just a little more mature and open. Of course, this is a psychedelic, just kidding. Um, but it has a wavy margin on the cap, you see? So it's the same cap color. Ooh, that's, so it's a little sticky. And it's got brown gills, the same as that other one did. And it has a fibrous stalk. So this is the same mushroom, just a different stage in its growth. You could also see it's got kind of a cone, an indentation in the center. That's a significant thing too. So they might be gallerina. Here's what they look like as babies. 
Oh, little spaceships. Not a psilocybin containing mushroom. Uh, gallerinas look. These are, this is probably a gallerina, and they're deadly poisonous, so don't make those mistakes. But, um, yeah, so God bless everyone, and thanks for having those discussions about um, whatever we can, you know, what happened yesterday with the Native American and the Make America Great Again peeps. Um, you know, I just want to say that I'm really grateful that we can even have that conversation because I don't see a lot of people having that conversation. I see a lot of people on one side or the other that just basically yell really loud and don't hear the other side. And so I'm just really appreciative to you all um, who jumped in and commented on that and shared and um, just keep it respectful, you know, like name calling is over, you know. And if we could just hold that steady, I think that we can have those conversations better than the media is, better than the news is, um, better than maybe the public society is. And that's going to be really helpful and healing because we can sort of get a common understanding and also uh, get our bullshit detectors really clear, uh, which we're going to need. And so thank you, friends, for, uh, you know, just sharing in that conversation. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. And, uh, you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. Free speech. Let's perceive what we can. Let's learn. And let's just be cordial. And let's not stoop to the same ridiculous level that um, is being prodded, right, through antagonism and name-calling and blaming and shaming. That stuff's over. Don't let it affect you the best that you can. <laughs> Do your Olympia with Peruvian peppercorn. And uh, I'll be back soon. Peace, friends.